In 2021, almost 10,000 Canadians requested and received medical assistance in dying, or MAID. That was the year that legislation expanded to mean that people did not have to be terminally ill to apply. In March of 2023, another proposed change will allow those with mental disorders to choose MAID. With us now on the advisability of that expanded access, we're joined in Vancouver, British Columbia by Dr. Derek Smith, clinical professor emeritus in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of British Columbia. And back here in our studio, Dr. Ramona Coelho, who practices family medicine in London, Ontario, her practice largely comprised of marginalized patients. Dr. Madeline Lee, psychiatrist in the Department of Supportive Care at the University Health Network, and Dr. Sonu Gand, professor in the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto and chief of psychiatry at Humber River Hospital. And we're happy that all of you could join us tonight for what is, uh, to be sure, a controversial and difficult conversation but one that is necessary, given what's about to transpire potentially next March. Uh, let's set this up. In the last few weeks, there have been a spate of urgent statements made by experts, some Conservative parliamentarians as well, calling for a delay in the implementation of Bill C-7, which would allow the inclusion of mental illness under the umbrella of MAID. Ramona Coelho, let's go to you first. What concerns you about allowing severe mental illness from being subject to MAID? Thanks for the question. I, I do think that for other uh, cases of MAID, like in the case of cancer or severe disabilities, there might be an understanding of prognosis and decline um, in which to guide um, a MAID assessor's ability to judge what, um, how this person will do and if this is an appropriate treatment for them as they consider it. But for mental illness, uh, there is currently no evidence to guide those kind of predictions of irritability. And I take care of very marginalized patients. So I take care of people. In Montreal, I was a home care doctor. I took care of people with mental health addictions in their homes, people with dementia or with or severe disabilities who were shut in. And so I have seen and worked with many people over many years who have gotten better when I didn't feel like they were going to get better. Mm -hmm. And um, that kind of uh, feeling could be transferred uh, in terms of made assessments and lead to deaths of people who might have recovered and had meaningful lives. So your concern is that they may be in the throes of something awful at the moment, but that is not to suggest and that not, they should not throw just in the a towel. moment. Like I would say, you know, yes, I have seen people suffer for several years where I also felt a lot of distress, a lot of distress. I'd go home and feel distress. But uh, being on the other side of it, um, I understand that recovery is possible. And with mental illness, I believe recovery is possible. Okay. So, again, I want to ask you about a comment that the federal health minister, Jean-Yves Duclos, said, which is that he insists a, and the quote is, a strong framework to guide assessors and providers will be in place before MAID becomes available for those suffering from mental illness. What's still needed for MAID to be accessible to Canadians suffering from severe mental illness in your judgment? So thank you for the question, and thank you for taking on this challenging topic. I know there are a range of views. Uh, I should point out at the outset that I'm not a conscientious objector. I have a lot of concerns about where we're headed, but I actually chair, I am the physician chair of my hospital MAID team. But in terms of this expansion to MAID for mental illness, I will be blunt. I will say that I believe it's irresponsible. And that's not just based on my opinion, it's based on the evidence of what we will and what we know we will be doing, what and what we know we will not be doing. So in terms of Minister Duclos' statement, this is the biggest change to psychiatric practice that I have experienced in my career, in my lifetime. I think most psychiatrists would say that. We're now three months before this change is supposed to be implemented, where rather than focusing on saying, we're gonna help with suicide prevention and help you live better, some patients were gonna say, yes, we understand you want to die, as Dr. Coelho said, patients with mental illness, we can't even honestly tell them that they won't get better. Some of them will, mm -hmm. but we will falsely tell them that they won't get better. Based on those assessments, in their moments of despair, they will choose MAID. And we're on the verge of doing this literally with no standards or guidelines. So it feels rushed to you? It's more than rushed. The sunset clause was based on less evidence than required to introduce a sleeping pill in Canada. You can look up what evidence is required to introduce any medication on Health Canada. None of 
any of that happen for this. The sunset clause was an arbitrary decision, political decision, to say that by March 2023, we will allow MAID for mental illness. And uh, by the way, along the way, let's figure out how we're going to do it. Minister Duclos is still saying that now, that, oh, don't worry, we'll know how to do it by then. Reassurances are not safeguards. And I'll point out that the expert panel that was tasked with actually providing us safeguards, protocols, and guidelines, they failed to provide any concrete guidelines for how to determine irremediability in mental illness. They specifically say, we cannot say the length, types, or number of treatments that should be required before providing death for mental illness. We cannot know how to distinguish between suicidality and made requests for mental illness. And yet, in three months from now, we're planning on introducing this. Okay, let's so, get another view here. I want to uh, go to Vancouver, British Columbia. Professor Derek Smith, I uh, want you to weigh in on this. Uh, in as much as in Ottawa, the Parliamentary Committee reviewing the law is going to report back next February. That turns out to be, as we've indicated, just weeks before, made automatically expands. I wonder where you stand on the question of whether the legislation ought to be delayed. Well, uh, I'm opposed to delaying the legislation, and I want to reframe the debate somehow. This is not about expanding MAID. It is about restoring rights to uh, individuals suffering from psychiatric illness. Now, we know under the Carter rules that uh, a person was eligible for MAID based just on a psychiatric diagnosis. What happened with C-14 was that the government took this right away, this charter right away, from patients with psychiatric illness uh, using the phrase, your natural death must be reasonably foreseeable. We know as well from the true Chagan case in Quebec that this was struck down as unconstitutional. So now we're in the process of restoring a charter right to psychiatric patients, one that was taken away by legislation. Uh, how can we proceed with this? Well, first of all, we know that 67% of Canadian psychiatrists believe that in some instances, psychiatric illness can be irremediable. Uh, psychiatric illness can be determined. Uh, the, the request for MAID can be differentiated from suicidal thoughts. There is main, huge differences between MAID and suicide. Uh, MAID is a, a, a conscious decision made after a careful assessment, usually involving the family, the primary care physician. Suicide is typically an action taken in private without consultation. We know that the grieving that takes place after MAID is a positive experience for families and, um, and patients. We know from suicide that it's just the opposite. So we, we don't need to confuse the suicide with MAID. They're two quite different uh, propositions and psychiatrists are perfectly capable of sorting that out. We also know from the Benlux countries that there is a small number of patients who will qualify. We're not talking here about huge numbers. My guess is if there's, if there's 10 or 15 patients a year in Canada, uh, that might be the, the maximum number. There's very small numbers, but these, these people are suffering. Uh, they, they have an interminable illness, and they really need to have their charter right uh, for, for accessing made restored. Well, I have a psychiatrist sitting right beside me here who's going to weigh in on this. Dr. Lee, where are you? Um, so I think I sit somewhere in the middle between Sonu and Derek, actually, mm -hmm. um, which is a challenging place to be. Uh, you know, I think that... My concerns are, I, I, I will come down on the side of saying that I, I think uh, we need a delay, that I think it's uh, problematic for many reasons that we're not ready, um, partly because we're only going to hear what the legislation is finally going to look like a couple, like a month before we're actually supposed to provide this. And there aren't, we're also working on, uh, we're supposed to be working on practice guidelines that won't come out until um, just a couple of months before it's actually going to happen. Um, even if those things are in place, we know what the legislation is going to look like. If there's any changes, the guidelines, the practice guidelines are out. We won't. And I'm working on a, an educational curriculum to train people on how to do this safely. None of that will have had the time to be implemented, to actually get out into uh, clinical practice. And I think there are a lot of doctors out there right now still who don't, and public, who don't even know that we're expanding this. Um, and those who do know aren't trained in it. And it's going to take time to expand this. My, my concern is not specific to mental illness. Um, I, and, you know, I, I agree with Derek's point that we cannot exceptionalize 
mental illness. We are probably restoring the legislation to what was in the original Supreme Court decision. Um, I'm not trying to exceptionalize mental illness. I actually think the concerns of mental illness apply to all track two cases. Uh, so I, I think we should treat it the same as track two. And my concern actually is with the readiness of the healthcare system. That, um, you know, when Bill C-14 first came out, none of us were prepared. It just came out and then suddenly we were supposed to be able to provide this. And the end result was I think there were cases uh, that of people who received MAID who maybe didn't need to, but we never heard about them because they all had terminal illness and uh, they, they didn't come to light. Then Bill C-7 passed and there were actually more cases and those we've been hearing about all over the news. Uh, and again, Bill C-7 passed without any preparation, without any time to prepare the system. And I would like to say that we shouldn't do it a third time uh, because I do think that there will be more. Um, I've got case examples where I, I, I think we're going to see more than we saw in the Benelux countries because our mental health system isn't as well established as it is in the, in the Benelux countries. Um, this is Belgium, Netherlands, Luxembourg, for those who don't yeah. know that acronym. We've got another very thoughtful voice standing by online from um, Vancouver, British Columbia, and that's Andre Picard, who's, uh, in my judgment, the finest health reporter and columnist in the country today. And Andre, we're glad to have you uh, aboard for this discussion as well. And, and during the course of our conversation here, we're going to ask a lot of questions. And I think, Andre, you put something in one of your columns recently uh, that, that that really gets to the nub of this, and that is whether we're asking the right question. Uh, in your column, you wrote, the question is not so much, has there been time to get it right, but rather, can we ever get it right? Which points to, of course, how fraught this subject is. What do you think the answer to that question is that you've posed? Well, I think, no, we'll never satisfy everyone. This is it, There's a fundamental problem with trying to legislate medical practice. Uh, when we do that, we always get ourselves in trouble. So, you know, I've been an advocate of uh, governments really have to get out of the way on this issue more than anything else, uh, leave it to the better judgment of medical practitioners. And I think that's how we've seen made play out. Uh, yes, as you just heard, uh, we weren't prepared for the previous bills, uh, C7, C14, but our, our practitioners did a good job. We have a good made system. Uh, it served people well. And we have to remember, this is being pushed by the public. This is being pushed by the courts. Uh, the public wants this. They want access to made for irremediable uh, illness, whether it's mental or physical. And the legislators have to catch up. And I think to a certain extent, medical practitioners have to catch up and make it work uh, because it's what people want and it's what they need. This artificial distinction between uh, mental health and, you know, this notion that, well, cancer, it's okay if you're dying of cancer, maid's great. But if you have this mental illness that is just untreatable, you're living in misery, uh, well, you should suffer a little bit longer. I, I, I'm not a member of the, the pro-suffering lobby, I'll put it that way. The pro-suffering lobby, okay, that's one way to put it. Let's put a face to this story. John Scully, is a name that uh, may ring a bell with some people. He's a former television reporter. He has been advocating for access to MAID. He was on W5, the CTV program, and he described his circumstances thus. Sheldon, the clip, please. I wake up sick and loathing the day, the, the day that's to come. I'm in fear of the day that's to come because during the night, I've had horrific nightmares and anxiety dreams that fill me with sweat and dread. Did any treatment work? You've tried well, everything. Everything. There's nothing to try for me, nothing left. I've tried every single so-called you know, so cure, in quotes. Um, I've tried, there's nothing I haven't tried that I know of. John's been in a Toronto psychiatric hospital seven times. He's tried electroconvulsive therapy 19 times. He now takes dozens of pills just to get through the day. And after 35 long years of treatment, still no improvement. I'm thinking, that's why I'm choosing MAID, um, because I don't want to botch it again. I screwed up twice trying to kill myself. I've known John Scully for 30 years. I used to work with him at CBC. That really puts a face to the story. Ramona Coelho, what do you want to say to him? Oh, I'm very sympathetic to his, his plight, of course. 
Um, there's a few things I'd like to say. Well, we're talking about a state giving the right of someone to end someone else's life with mental illness. So this is a population discussion, not a, not a conversation of one. I don't doubt that there are some people with irremediable mental illness. The question is, can we identify them correctly? And really, is structural inequalities playing into that? The other thing that I'd like to say, and that I'm sure Dr. Gaines could comment on, or Dr. Lee more than me, because I don't know the stats perfectly, is that in the Benelux countries, in jurisdictions that have legalized assisted suicide and euthanasia, suicide rates have gone up, um, which I think speaks to the question of the contagion of despair, the, the risk of the contagion of despair. You're sure there's a connection access. between these two things? No, I'm, I'm raising the question that I don't think that we've thought about this enough. Could there be a contagion of despair? What happens when you create access? We know that access to lethal means and other things like guns or uh, pesticides, suicide rates go up. What is going to happen to our society when we legislate, that, like, when we go forward? Have we thought about these things? We need to think about Mr. Scully. I mean, that's very important, but we also have to think about the whole population. Well, let me put that to Dr. Lee, because here's an example where I guess the experts are responsible for having to create policies that, that can cover the vast population of the country. But then you see that single example. Uh, I don't know about you. I mean, my heart breaks for the guy. Everybody's heart breaks for the guy. What, how, how, do we, how do we figure that out where we, where we can create one policy for all and yet help him? You know, I think it comes back to a point that Andre has written about, right? That you're try we're trying as a society to decide where we stand on the balance between autonomy um, and protecting the vulnerable. Uh, and I want to use the word autonomy versus protection, not paternalism, right? Because paternalism is not a defensible position. No one wants to be paternalistic. It's really about protection. Um, and I'd say that in this debate, there's actually been too much heat and not enough light, right? That there actually is a way of looking at individual cases where I think that you have to, I, I feel a lot, again, for, for what what John Scully is saying, and I think that when we're trying to protect vulnerable people, um, we have to think about um, vulnerabilities beyond just uh, are, are they accessing services, that's one of them, but also there, there are many structural and social vulnerabilities, and I think when I start with an individual patient, my first question is, are they vulnerable? Um, I would never make a decision based on a one-minute video whether somebody um, is sure. eligible for MAID or not. But on the surface, looking at his video, he didn't strike me as vulnerable. But I know a little bit about his case. I'd like to know more about his trauma. I'd like to know about his relationships. I'd like to know um, more about his personality. I'd like to know... Does any of that matter when he is clear in his own mind this is what he wants? It is if there's a source of vulnerability there. And I have a role as a clinician to protect that. And what I would say is that the desire for death is really way more complex than people think. It's... It, it's um, it's a collapse of complexity to bring it down to are you psychotic and delusional or impulsively suicidal or not, right? That's too simplistic. I think people want to die for a multitude of social, psychological, and unconscious factors, and we, we need to help them understand that. Dr. Gann, what do you... You see this case of John Scully, what do you think? So I see the case, my heart goes out for him. And I think for any empathic human, that would be the natural reaction. I also think that we have to base our policies not on individual cases, but on how they will affect everyone as a population. And I would reframe, actually, Mr. Picard's question. You know, rather than asking, can we ever get it right? I think the real question is, which mistakes do we want to make? And that reframes it in a different way, because what we know is that when we expand assisted dying beyond end-of-life situations, people shift what they are seeking death for. As Dr. Lee was mentioning, people seek death for different reasons. When MAID is provided and the end-of-life is foreseeable, people seek it to avoid uh, suffering uh, from a painful death. When we extend it further and further from death, people seek it to avoid a painful life. They seek it as escape from a painful life. And that's what the data in the Benelux countries shows. Does that matter, though? Yes, it does, because 
What we're doing is we're shifting who is actually seeking it for social reasons that we could fix in other ways. I will use a burning building analogy. You know, um, a greatly esteemed colleague, Dr. Harvey Chachanov, he's used the analogy of it not being true autonomy. If you have a burning building and somebody decides to jump from that, that's not true autonomy about them wanting to end their lives. We are setting up for the marginalized people in our society who are the ones who actually preferentially get made in Benelux countries when it's expanded to psychiatric euthanasia, two to one women to men as well, by the way. Mm -hmm. Increased rates of poverty and social suffering once you expand it. We're taking this and our the, the burning building, those are our policies. Those are our social policies that have led people to these marginalized situations and sometimes even set fire to the building. Our governments, those are the landlords. And what I would suggest to you is that rather than saying put out the fire, stop the burning, design a safer building, or let's lead people to a safer exit, I think that people who are saying on the side, for example, and, and you know, Mr. Picard, you're saying that it's autonomy to help the person jump here. I think that out the window, I don't agree with that. I don't think that's a truly autonomous choice. Okay, let's, him, let's let him respond. Andre Picard, you want to come back in here? Well, I don't think it's a good choice to say stay in the building and keep burning. Uh, you know, that's, that's what we're saying. We're saying keep suffering. We can't give you an out. Why? Well, because you're poor, because we don't take uh, mental health problems as seriously as uh, physical health ones like cancer. I, I agree that we really have to improve our ment access to mental health care. I'd love to have no fire in the building, but the answer is not to say no one can have an out because it makes us uncomfortable. Some people, uh, you heard in that clip very eloquently, just don't get treatment. It just doesn't work. They want it out. Uh, we can't, we don't say to cancer patients, hey, there might be this slim hope that there's going to be a new drug to, to treat you. So you better hang in there a little while, uh, just live with a little more, more pain and we're not going to give you made. We're do, we have different rules and different uh, for people with mental illness and it's, it's not fair. I, I, ideally, yeah, nobody should have made, uh, nobody should die, nobody should be in, living in poverty, but we shouldn't exclude people because they uh, live in unfortunate circumstances. You know, right now, made is for the privileged. It's not fair. It's unjust. And we have to fix that balance. Let me get we have to give some people the out. Let me get Derek Smith on this in as much as the question Dr. Gan just asked, which was which mistakes do we want to make? Does that reframe this in a way that you find acceptable? I don't want us to make any mistakes, but there is no evidence to date that the vulnerable are, taking, are being taken advantage of. Just the opposite, if you look at the statistics, the average person accessing MAID is over 75, has an illness like cancer or a neurological condition. No evidence of the vulnerability, vulnerable being taken advantage of. Just the opposite, the vulnerable are not uh, having a, uh, adequate access to MAID. This is not about about collective rights. This is all about the individual rights of patients, of citizens. This is a charter right. The decisions were made based on individuals, Kay Carter, uh, John Touchon, uh, many other cases. So we have to restore the individual charter rights to individuals, including psychiatric patients. If they meet all of the criteria, then they should be eligible to have an assisted death the same as anybody else. And we know again from other countries, that this system can be implemented, it can be implemented safely, and it will benefit a very small number of, of cases. We can't forget the vast majority of cases have nothing to do with, uh, uh, with mental illness. This is a small number, and we need to just get on and put it into place. Let me get Dr. Coelho on that, because this is now twice we've heard this argument that this does not extend rights. This is restoring rights that already existed and have been ignored. Your view on that? Yeah, so I disagree with uh, Dr. Smith. Uh, Car the Carter case was meant to allow people who would not be able to commit suicide later to have someone help end their life earlier because we understood that they were in an irreversible state of decline. We do not have that evidence with mental illness. We don't know how to predict that irreversible state of decline. Um, the other thing that is very different from the Benelux countries, so first of all, Dr. Gaines did point out 
that um, the Benelux countries do have evidence of psychiatric euthanasia, and it's worrisome, high levels of trauma, double the rate of females to males, um, people who have like loneliness, relationship breakdowns, these things are worrisome that, that we're offering death as that uh, for a solution. But what I would say is that also on the ground already for track two, like you're right, it has just started. So our stats look really good. But I take care of very poor marginalized patients and um, some of them have been offered made for their psychosocial suffering. I have a patient who's been waiting a year now. She had a mild spinal cord injury, she can walk, but she's getting pretty desperate. And um, because desperate she's- to do what? To, to have made because she can't, she's worried she won't be able to go back to her work. And while she's waiting, she is thinking about MAID, and she has a 90-day start date. And her father has also been approved for MAID. He was approved for MAID within two weeks of him saying to his geriatrician, I'm not sure in the future I want to go to a long-term care home. So he's not even asking to die now. The geriatrician thought it was a great idea to connect him to the MAID team, which approved him on the basis of his disability, even though he wants made for fear of suffering, of ending up in a long-term care home. So he turned it down and they said, you can come back when you're ready and you will be approved for made. I want, apropos of the, uh, the geriatric angle on this, I want to ask you about a piece that you wrote for McLean's Magazine in which you talked about the story of your own mother, who, I, I, I guess, is this the way to put it? Who, who sort of wanted to be put out of her own misery. And let's just read an excerpt from that. You wrote, medical practitioners are trained to evaluate capacity based only on a person's cognitive decision-making ability, but most people also make emotionally-based decisions. In cases such as my mother, both rational and irrational thinking may be present at the same time, with cultural factors adding to the complexity, and it may be impossible to distinguish what is driving the desire to die. Is there a right desire to die, and how do we distinguish that from the wrong desire to die, if I can put it that way? So I don't think I would put it as a right and wrong desire to die. Okay. I would come back to saying what I said earlier, that there's a complexity to the desire mm -hmm. to die. Uh, and one of my concerns is that right now, we really don't have good frameworks for evaluating uh, the emotional decision making and how rational that is. We, we don't have tools to help us with that yet. Um, and that's why I was getting at the desire to die is far more complex than most people think. I think what we as clinicians need to do is open a space for patients, um, a curious space where we explore with them what's going on be behind that wish. Are there unconscious factors? Are there, um, are there factors that actually, actually that could be addressed? Um, and I think that the problem is not a lot of people know how to have that conversation with patients. And what we aren't even paying attention to is the fact we spend a lot of time talking about autonomy, but actually autonomy is by itself a complex thing that they're not, decisions are not ever purely autonomous, right? Our relationships affect our decisions. Healthcare providers affect patients' decisions, right? Whether my saying to you, it's okay, you can, that's, okay for you to die, or it's not okay for you to die, I don't think you should, influences what you think. Um, and we need to train clinicians to have those conversations, and we haven't had the time to do that. Well, let me try this with Andre Picard. You know, uh, Andre, we've heard on the program already that this is, this is likely not to affect many more than who knows what, 10 or 15 people in the whole country every year. And I don't want to sound flippant in the way I'm asking this question, but is this, is this potentially much ado about not nothing, but, but not very many people. I, I think it's not going to be very many people, but I think it is not much to do about nothing. I think these issues are really, really important to discuss ethics, to make these difficult choices. I, I get to talk to a lot of made assessors. I know that they really, you know, they struggle with this. These are very difficult decisions to make, but there are many, many difficult decisions in medicine every day. We forget to, you know, how do people die now? We essentially let older people starve to death. That's what we do. Uh, MAID has come and allowed people to alleviate some of that suffering. Uh, they used to die with inadequate pain uh, medication from cancer. MAID has uh, alleviated that. In this case, we're going to allow people with intractable mental illness to get uh, 
to escape their, their lives a little earlier rather than, say, jumping off a building or otherwise killing themselves. We can't forget that a lot of these people do end their lives and they end them in a horrible fashion. I, uh, you know, I, I know I'm described by some people on the panel as sort of a pro-made person, and I am. And I think what changed my mind is I covered a story many years ago of a couple, a Holocaust survivors, an elderly couple. Uh, they felt their lives had come to an end. They were suffering all kinds of minor uh, illnesses, and they held hands and they jumped off the balcony of their luxury apartment. That's an unspeakable awfully way to die. That's not how people should die. They should have had made. And I know people who with mental illness who have killed themselves, who could have you know, died differently. You know, they didn't have great lives. I, I think we have to give people this option. And I have in a lot of sympathy for the made assessors. These are really, really difficult choices. But ultimately, if you're going to err, it always has to be on the, the side of patient choice, of patient autonomy, not on what makes us uncomfortable. So, again, we're down to our last couple of minutes here, and I, I want to, you know this, 62% of Canadians in a recent survey said that they were in favor, either they agree or they are somewhat in agreement with the notion of people being able to be, to have access to MAID in the event of mental illness. Is that relevant to you? It's relevant, but I think people need to know what they're getting made for. You had asked the question before about is there a right or wrong desire to die? Mm -hmm. I would reframe that again, and I would say we need to be honest about what we are providing death for. And this gets to the fundamental issue right now about mental illness. Notwithstanding Dr. Smith or other expansion activists' beliefs, evidence shows us that we cannot actually predict when a mental illness will not get better in any individual. CAMH says that. It's been studied by the CCA over a year and a half. International studies have looked at that. And so every actual scientific group has agreed, including the Quebec Association favoring expansion, they acknowledge that somebody could get made who could have gotten better and could have regained the will to live. So if we go back to the burning building analogy, the more valid analogy is we don't know how long that fire is going to be burning. Mr. Picard talks about intractable suffering from the mental illness. The reality is we cannot predict that. Those are false predictions. Recent evidence shows that we're probably less than 50-50, uh, which is worse than flipping a coin at doing that. But does that, so does that it does at the end matter. of the day matter? It does matter if, because if, if we want to, if we, but then we should be honest about it and say, our made laws are not based on the false premise of your medical condition will never get better. That is the fundamental safeguard and that's being bypassed. If society wants to say, well, once you've had enough suffering, then you can get made, that is what the law should say. That should be the honest discourse. It shouldn't be a false premise of providing death under the wrong reasons. Okay, here's where I've got to jump in because we're plumb out of time. And uh, I appreciate that we barely scratched the surface here at a very complicated ethical discussion, but I'm truly grateful to all of you. Sheldon, thank you for the wide shot. Uh, let's thank all of our guests, Derek Smith, Andre Picard, Ramona Coelho, Madeline Lee, Sonu Gain, for coming into our um, studio, both uh, actually and virtually, to have this conversation, uh, which no doubt will continue between now and next March. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.